sure you actually ever become an artist. It's maybe something in you that refuses to stay quiet. I think there's that creative thing in all of us and it's a very important part of being alive and navigating your way through the world. When I was 12, the trouble started in Belfast. We were living in a very specific time and place. So in some ways, the creative was an escape route, a way of kind of dealing with um, a lot of traumatic and dramatic things that were going on around me. Probably one of the most important things that I had in my life when I was young was the happenstance to grow up on the doorstep of the Ulster Museum. So at the weekends and any opportunity at all, we were in the Ulster Museum looking at things and that kind of exposure to, that, to the world of paintings, to the world of these little windows into the imagination was something that was very formative. Certainly at art school, I had very fixed ideas. In some ways, I probably was quite reluctant in that I had a very strong sense of what I wanted to do. The seminal moment at art school was when my painting tutor, who had lived in Belfast for 15 or 16 years, asked me why people were wearing black armbands. And I had to explain to him it was because the second hunger striker had died. And I remember feeling how strange it was to live somewhere, to be somewhere, and to not know that something like that was actually going on. And that made me realize that to have any um, chance of authenticity in your work or to have any relevance in making art, it really should be very specific to a time and place. And that, was worth going to art school for just that one conversation. Leaving art school, I was determined to make my living as an artist, so I, I took on all sorts of work, illustrating the front of books and you know, being very much kind of a lateral thinker, trying to find ways that I could do what I do, what I wanted to do, and to also make some money at it. It kind of formed the shape of my practice in that I worked on community projects where I knew I was getting paid, and I was meeting people and I was seeing other lives, and I worked in the studio making paintings for exhibitions in galleries, and now that has followed, that has continued right through my practice. Now I can see there's a kind of a symbiosis there, there's a kind of an interconnectedness. And as I get older, I realize sometimes it's a book that I've read that really influences me or, you know, politics. And I realize now that quite often the idea comes in a fusion of all of those, which is which I suppose is a clear indication that it's so important to nourish your mind with literature, you know, to really kind of answer your curiosity. Travel, that was one of the biggest things. When I was a student, I probably was, was nourished more by traveling and going, you know, working in America as a dishwasher and going off and seeing all the big collections and never stopping. That idea of kind of like, oh, that's it, I've done with education now. That's not true. We are learning and growing until we take our last breath. So it's, I suppose it's part of your attitude towards life. But if you want to have an interesting life, don't feed your mind junk food.
it's kind of foolish to think you can just dash into a canvas and produce something. That It's a very brave step. And 99 times out of 100, it's going to be failure. So what I do is I kind of get the idea in my head and I make drawings. And drawings, I can't emphasize enough, are the, the foundation of anything visual. Pin those up, look at them, make changes in my head. And then you're sort of like, it's like someone's holding your hand into a painting. You begin and each day you watch. The beauty of actually creating something is that it's totally yours. And you can choose to kind of push it and finish it or throw it away. And the painting tells you whenever it's finished. When I was working on the Fellowship of Trinity, I had started off, I was supposed to do all sorts of different things. And then wham, in comes COVID-19 and everything kind of changed. So I started to make drawings, like very particular anatomical drawings of hearts. It made you feel really mortal that somehow you could catch this virus and die. And, you know, it was all over the world. It was a strange, strange thing to live through. And then it was the springtime and flowers were blossoming in the garden. And I kind of thought, we are never without hope. So hence, the anatomy of hope was born. And that turned into an animation. And it was the first time I had ever made an animation. So it was kind of exciting. You know, you put, you set little challenges for yourself and you run after it, put the work in, and who knows where it'll take you. There's reassurance from nature, and that work in the anatomy of hope was very much um, plumbing the, exploring the area of Irish folk culture, the traditions of Bridget, you know, the holy wells, the wishing trees, you know, the healing cures. And I know that there's more there that I want to kind of revisit. I know there's enough energy and interest for me in that area for it possibly to be work that I'll do in another year. I've never made a painting where I've thought I'm gonna sell this. That kind of is down the line somewhere or other. Of course, I like selling paintings, but I don't do them for that reason. I do them for the need to express myself, the need to kind of bring them into being. Um, and then when you're standing with X, Y, or Z painting, you realize that this one should go that direction. That one, maybe there are more paintings to be made around that. Maybe I'll hold on to that forever because I absolutely love it. It's all a continuum, really. Once you get started, it's a bit like freewheeling down a hill sometimes. And then there are other times it's like needing to get into a really low gear and taking it push by push. So the paintings, like water, find their way out. You aspire for something that you're working on to be the best thing you've ever done. And that's kind of worth holding on to because that's a sort of part of the energy of making something happen. But if you clear out all of the other stuff, like I don't care whether people like things or dislike them. I, I kind of have a healthy disregard for other people's opinions. However, allow you know, influence to come in a little bit where it seems intelligent. But in terms of kind of audience or other people's perceptions, you have no control over that. I have no control over anything other than that brush and what I'm thinking about. So there is this lovely unison. It's a beautiful way of expressing yourself. It's like how, you know, two people listening to the same piece of music will not dance the same way. And it's like celebrating that part of yourself that is quite, quite unique. And being able to express yourself is a really, really important thing for any human being. It's an incredible way of building your inner self. To me, this is my kind of healthy obsession. It's a good way to maintain some sense of mental and physical 
capability, strengths, call it what you will. And I don't get a nine to five salary. I don't have a pension plan. But what I do have in kind of compensation for that is a, is a job that day on day fascinates me. It's a different type of coming at the world. And it's interesting, in the century that we've moved into, it's becoming more and more important to privilege that area of the imagination because it's only through our imaginative intellect that we as a species will maintain some semblance of positive constructive life on this planet.